So today I'm going to talk about how can you discuss ADHD without shame? How can we teach our kids to discuss ADHD without shame? And how can you discuss your own ADHD without shame? So the first is let's normalize it a bit. So um, ADHD is a very a common both uh, it's actually more common than you think, both in the United States and in the world. So let's look at some statistics. About 6.1 million children in the United States, around 9 to 10%, between the ages of 2 and 17, have been diagnosed with ADHD at some point. Um, ADHD is one of the most common neurodevelopmental um, conditions of childhood. And while figures vary, worldwide prevalence of for ADHD in children and teens is estimated at about 5%. Now, adults with ADHD in the United States, it's around 4.4% um, with a higher diagnosis in men and in women as it is for children. In children, it's about three, um, three males for every female. And um, in adults, it's about two to one. Um, in the you know world statistics for ADHD, the worldwide prevalence of ADHD is around three percent. And part of the reason that we see so much difference between those high number, the, the ten percent for kids, or um, you know worldwide, uh, where it's um, a little bit less, uh, is is uh, at five percent. And the lower numbers for adults, it has to do with the way ADHD is diagnosed and the measures which with which we use to diagnose ADHD, which are more robust in children and teens than they are in adults, number one. Number two, a lot of adults with ADHD managed to get through their childhood and their adolescence and their early adulthood, perhaps even into mid-adulthood without a diagnosis. They adjusted and, and compensated for the ways in which their brain worked differently. And so um, it wasn't for a lot of adults, it's not until you have a child who is diagnosed that you realize, wow, you know what? I'm like that too. So let's normalize, you know, whenever you get diagnosed is is the right time and we wanna make them the best of it. So what I'd like to do today is to ask you, how do you describe your ADHD to others and where do you get stuck? What kinds of reactions do you find are, are the most challenging and what are the reactions that are the most welcoming? Because we want to try to understand what the difference is between someone who approaches you with openness and compassion and how you respond to that and some tools for when people come to you with their bias and their prejudice and their dismissal that everybody has a little ADHD so it's not such a big deal. This makes me personally crazy. So I'm gonna start off with Stephanie. She says, my six-year-old struggles really hard with ADHD. We just started taking Journey. He just started taking Journey. So I don't know what Journey is. If That sounds like it's not the actual name of the medication. If you can tell me what that is, that would be helpful. How can I help him reach his best self? Writing is hard for him and he gets really angry with outbursts. Um, so what we want to do with kids with ADHD is who are young children in particular is we want to find a few things that they love to do and uh, that they think they're good at and you also can support that they're good at. And in those cases, what we want to try to do is pay attention to those, to grow those as much as possible and to keep limits around the things that are hard for them time-centered limits, limits such as, okay, you're going to work on this hard writing thing for five minutes, and then we're going to set the timer, and when the five minutes is off, the five minutes is over, we're going to take a little break, or task, you're going to do three math problems, and then we're going to have a body break, and then we're going to do three more. So, so we want to balance that, okay? Because that's how we're going to shore up those challenges. We don't want to spend for young kids, you know, a lot of time on the things that are super hard for them. They have to do them, of course, but let's do it in a time limited way and spend a little more time on building those skills for things that they like to do that they're already showing some uh, capacity for. 
Uh, hi, Kate from London. Hi from New York. You have a son, a six-year-old. So one of the things um, that, you know, that's really hard, Gail, you say you struggle with executive functions, of course. Hi, Charlie from the UK. You can invite me there too. Uh, I can't wait to travel again. Um, uh, m yourself and your child. My question is about inattentive version of ADD in boys. What a great thing to bring up. I only hear about ADHD in boys, but I'm an inattentive type and my four-year-old is displaying the same similar types. Seems to be a daydreamer at school. Interested to know more about this. So um, boys, you know, the ratio of boys who are diagnosed with ADHD to girls is roughly three to one. And some, and a lot of that is hyperactivity, impulsivity, but there are boys who are inattentive. And um, actually boys who are inattentive have a higher risk of being overlooked for ADHD because it's the hyperactive and impulsive kids who are drawing the attention that something is off. And it's the, in, in general, the inattentive types who kind of, you know, fly under the radar for a while until it's clear that they're, they're actually not able to tune into what's going on around them. So I, I do think that it's important that you're noticing this now, and particularly if you have this yourself. ADHD also changes over time. So what we see in, in kids who are diagnosed as hyperactive and attentive over time, that that may change to be uh, inattentive, actually. What we see in kids who are inattentive is that that remains relatively consistent. So there are ways in which kids change. And we also see combined type as continuing into adulthood as combined type. Um, Fleur, you have a 10-year-old with ADHD and you're from New Zealand. Uh, you and your son have ADHD and ASD uh, that also uh, it runs in families. So one thing I want to say is a lot of you have kids with ADHD or ASD. And I know that for that there's a 57% chance if a, if, if a child has ADHD that one of their biological parents has ADHD. So there is a link, which is why, you know, we see, I see so often and many other practitioners do too, kids who are diagnosed and then adults come in and say, wow, you know what? I struggle with this or I used to struggle with this, but I got, you know, I got sent to detention or I was yelled at. No one really paid attention to it. It wasn't something that was a, was a condition that was attended to. Hi, Julie from Ontario, Marsha from Wales, Jasmine from Germany. Um, Carrie, you're a first generation using the tools. That's great. Hello, Christine from Hampshire, Francie. Are there any studies about how COVID affects children and teens with ADHD? Well, it's really funny that you should ask that question. Um, uh, because there are some studies that are coming out now. I actually wrote a research paper on this topic on how COVID was affecting neurodiverse learners for the first, you know, in the spring of 2020. And of course, what we see is that COVID is affecting kids with ADHD in a number of ways, ways in which it, 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 it you, you know, it, in terms of the isolation um, and um, and the you know the frustration with so much you know learning on screen that we see in neurotypical kids, but it's you know more intensified. So one of the challenges with COVID learning for kids with ADHD is the screen. These are kids who are used to being in a classroom and receiving signals from their peers, signals from their teachers that they you know when to redirect, when to go back to task, you know to be able to raise their hand and ask a question. Things that they that they they use to help ground themselves to actually be in a classroom and perform the tasks that they need to are no longer accessible. In addition, I'm talking a little fast here, huh, guys? In addition, asynchronous learning, you know, learning where someone says, here, do this task, come back and show me how you've done, is very, very hard for kids with ADHD because they don't have those cues, because they don't have someone sitting with them. The other thing that I've been thinking about is that staying on screens is very challenging for kids with ADHD um, for one reason. Screens are where you play 
and screens are now where you learn and there's a confusion it's hard to keep the boundaries and so what happens for kids with adhd is they struggle more with sustained attention with not clicking into onto a TikTok video or you know something else that their social media account it's very difficult for them to stay focused on what's happening and a large part of that is because it's not that engaging you know teachers are often struggling with how to engage learners on screens sometimes kids don't even have to show their camera or their faces and they have their camera on, but they don't have to show their faces. They can use an avatar or they just have a picture of themselves. Um, so there's not a way in which teachers are engaging kids. You know, you maybe you write something in the chat once an hour so your teacher knows you're, you're there. It's not the same as being in a classroom. And this is very difficult for kids with ADHD. So yes, um, the other piece has the lack of physical activity. You know, a lot of kids with ADHD uh, enjoy sports or athletics or just being outside. That's a way that they um, get some of their any energy out. It's a place where they may have other skills or talents that aren't academic, and that has been removed. And finally, we have social challenges. It's not the same to interact with your friends on screen as it is in person. And for kids with ADHD who often miss social cues due to inattention, they're missing things and they're overwhelmed because in, when you're on screen for a classroom, everybody can see you. It's not like if you're in a classroom, you can hide a little bit. You can look away or look out the window and no one notices as much as if you're on screen and everyone can see you. I hope this is helpful. Um, uh, you also have snow in Greece. Wow. Oh my goodness. Um, Hallie, you were just diagnosed with ADHD and you're 24. Can ADHD, I missed that. I'm so sorry. Can ADHD be misdiagnosed as anxiety? I think that was your question. So ADHD rarely travels alone. It usually brings along some friends. Maybe that's a learning disability 70% of the time. Maybe that's another mental health can at least a mental health condition or um, and or a learning disability that's 87% of the time. So most people with ADHD have a secondary diagnosis 87% of the time. Anxiety travels very frequently with ADHD, as we know, um, and particularly for women who have ADHD, there's often anxiety. Um, there's anxiety about um, whether it's, you know, in the social arena, specific social anxiety, whether it's general anxiety, Oh, there's a worry about when the next time you're going to mess up and what's going to happen when you do. Um, well, what if you what if someone says something and you misinterpret? How's that going to look? There's a lot of anxiety that goes along with ADHD. So um, I don't usually see ADHD misdiagnosed. I don't usually see a, um, I there. What am I trying to say? Sometimes these diagnoses look the same. But here's the question that we want to ask. When people are anxious, there's usually a similar set of circumstances or triggers that set off their anxiety. That's not the case for ADHD. Um, Stacy asks, is it possible a 13 year old girl may be seemingly out of nowhere demonstrate ADD tendencies? So um, I think that's a really good question. So one of the things that I'm seeing a lot are people feeling like their kids have attention issues right now. And often um, anxiety or depression can, can, can masquerade as ADHD. Um, or as an, I mean, that's not correct. What it can masquerade is having an attention issue. And it masquerades that way because right now kids are more inattentive. Neurotypical kids are more inattentive and kids with ADHD are more inattentive. And that has to do with their level of frustration, their isolation, their disinterest, their lack of motivation in all things pandemic related, including school. So if your child is demonstrating um, some of the you know, typical ADHD symptoms, difficulty um, with organization, difficulty with sustained attention, forgetfulness, and other traits, then that's it's time to take them to a primary care provider who will probably do some rating scales or to ask for an evaluation at school. I also think that we can't underestimate the effect of the pandemic and pandemic learning on kids' ability to pay attention. 
Beatrice, ugh, I can't keep up with the comments and, and Facebook is erasing them. So Beatrice, send it again, please. Um, hi, Chris, you got diagnosed three years ago. Wow, and you're 33. I hope it's been helpful. Jamie, you get lost in organizing thoughts, writing, job training, forgetting instructions. Well, actually, this is act very true for a lot of people with ADHD, that it's hard to focus on the task at hand. And what what in order to focus on the task at hand, number one, it has to be compelling, right? And number two, you have to notice when you're drifting off so you can pull yourself back. So what are the kinds of distractions that you're experiencing and what kinds of tips and tools do you need you know whether it's an app like called stay focused that shoots across your screen to help you remember or do you need to set a timer would you consider medication might that help you because a lot of focus and concentration is uncon there are parts of it that are unconscious and so the medication could help you be more available to learn the skills you need Alan, um, again, I don't know what to do because these things are going by too fast. Um, hi, James, you're st struggling with slow processing speed in Chicago. Um, so slow processing speed is very frustrating, particularly if you're high, of high, if you're a person of high intelligence or you grasp things, certain things really quickly and you're slower on other things. And partially that's because you, your brain just can't, you know, process and take the information in, figure out where it needs to go at the same rate that you comprehend what's going on. And that kind of with in-person difference is very frustrating. And so we have to figure out how you can give yourself the space and the supports you need to process the information in a timely fashion and in a way that you can retain. Um, uh, Mari, my son just stopped using his meds this week and he has ADHD combined type. How can I tackle this transition, especially with school focus? He's been on break this week, goes back to class next week. Um, the more um, executive functioning support you have for your son, the better, the more structure and the more routines, the more predictability will help him uh, stay on task. Chris asks, what are your, your, your views regarding childhood maltreatment propagating ADHD development in teens, in children? Well, there have been some studies coming out of Russia and the orphanages in Russia in particular that showed that the that long-term neglect actually uh, affects brain development and that people who have experienced abusive uh, early childhood experiences um, do develop uh, brain ADHD brain-like structures, some of which are smaller, um, such as um, the corpus callosum and other parts of the brain. Um, high, inact, inner hyperactivity is a really big problem and Anastasia in Greece. So what you're saying is um, hyperactivity is a problem because they don't know how to deal with it. I'm not sure what your question is. Uh, methylphenidate extended release, thank you so much, um, is what your six-year-old is on. Uh, is that, Stephanie, is that helping? Um, and if it's not helping, then I would go back to your prescriber because either maybe the dose is too low or um, it's not the right medication. Um, Gina, being diagnosed at 46, my friends and family find it hard to believe because of well-developed coping skills. Let's talk about this. However, they also express frustration with my difficulty tracking conversations, struggles with time management, um, and difficulty at home with self-motivation. Um, uh, and regulating impulsivity. So I, I think this is a great um, point to bring up, several points, Gina, so thank you for doing that. So at, at 46, you have developed very good coping skills for a number of your challenges. Um, and But what people are telling you is that they notice that you struggle with tracking conversations, with time management, you're disorganized, trouble you know, regulate, regulating um, and managing motivation. So um, one of the things that I think is important to say to people who are, you know, may doubt your diagnosis is that often for women, we cope rather than ask for help. We don't, sh we don't have behaviors that, that, that are neon signs like, 
I'm acting inappropriately. I'm, you know, super hyperactive. I can't sit in my chair. I'm just slowly unraveling. I'm slowly, you know, on my own, not managing or feeling persistently overwhelmed. And that's why it's so important for women to get diagnosed. And we often see an increase in diagnosis in, um, in young women as they transition from high school to college or from college to life, because the supports that were in place, particularly, you know, all of the F executive functioning scaffolding, you know, full, you know, sort of fades into the background when they move on to being alone. Um, uh, puberty and executive functioning skills. Um, there's something about, oh, Annie, you're saying, yes, it can cause previous coping mechanisms to break down. Absolutely. And so one of the things that happens in puberty in the hormonal soap, soup that is our brain is that, that all of those hormones are shifting the chemical balance in our brains or whatever imbalance there was that maybe, you know, create making that a little bit more intense or even more imbalanced. And so we see a shift uh, in kids um, when they're in middle school, also because when they move from um, primary school or elementary school to middle school, again, there's uh, the, the, the expectations and the scaffolding changes. And so kids are more, you know, there's more on them to manage um, independently. And that's when we start to also see, hmm, this child is not making this transition successfully. What can, what's going on? Um, uh, again, things are going by so fast. It's, it's so frustrating. Um, how did you get to a doctor to assess you for ADHD? My doctor blew it off when I brought it up. She said, if you have had it, it, you've managed it this long. Okay. So Allie, what I want to say to you and Julianne is that is absurd and your doctor is completely ill-informed. See another doctor. You know, if your doctor says no, check out a psychiatrist or um, a psychiatric nurse practitioner who can assess you or consider getting um, a psychoeducational evaluation. Um, so, um, that's very hurtful that your doctor would do that. And I'm sure that's really discouraging, but I would move forward. Your instinct is telling you something you need to listen to it. Um, I homeschooled for three years. So virtual school's going well, says Francie. Uh, tasks have to be interesting to help with focus. Exactly. Sometimes I would creatively add humor or stories to help tasks become more fun to complete. Thank you for that suggestion. Any way that you can make a task more interesting will keep your kids uh, engaged with the task. Jessica, inattentive type plus asynchronous remote learning equals almost no learning for my kiddo. So hard. I'm only laughing because that's a funny equation. Um, it is horrible. It is horrible. And I think schools that are doing asynchronous learning for kids, particularly kids who are neurodiverse, shame on them. Because no, no child who has ADHD or is high functioning autism or has a learning um, difference is going to be able to, to motivate and monitor themselves sufficiently with asynchronous learning. Any extra support you can get, um, you are entitled to. And I think particularly for kids um, in the United States or kids in other countries where, they're, where the, the districts are, the public schools are mandated to provide support, this is the time to advocate and ask for it. Um, Okay. Um, I'm also, I'm trying to get to know if my 10 year old son has ADHD. He has dyslexia, anxiety, and trauma. Symptoms of trauma are quite similar to ADHD. So it seems complex. Yes. And I saw that Annie posted something about uh, Nicole Brown. She did, Dr. Nicole Brown did a wonderful presentation on trauma and ADHD. And um, there is some overlap. Um, some psychiatrists have felt like if there's you know significant trauma and the, and they give some medication to help with the anxiety, um, that will reduce some of the um, effect of trauma. And it can um, research has shown that medication for ADHD can assist with um, dyslexia and improving that when the skills and the instruction is is coexisting. 
Um, Haley, I'm going to do therapy at the end of September. And I talked, I started going to therapy at the end of September and talked with her about my anxiety and mentioned those kinds of meds haven't done much for me and mentioned thinking that I had it. She agreed and suggested somewhere to go to be tested. Great. I encourage you to do that, please. Uh, Annie, is refusal to take medication normal at any at middle school age? Any tips on getting her to take her medication? Yes, refusal of taking medication at middle school age is absolutely normal. And here's why. Adolescence is a, is the dance of the of push push me pull you that weird animal from Doctor Doolittle. If any of you remember that, um, kids want to stay connected, but they're also trying to figure out their sense of boundaries where they where they begin, where you end. And medication is one way that they can say no. I don't want to do this. You want me to do this. I don't want to do it. And what I found for kid, middle schoolers who don't want to take their medication is to do a scientific experiment with them. Say, okay, you don't want to take your medication. We'll go for two, three weeks and we'll see how it goes. How does it go in school? How is it going at home? Each at the end of each week, we'll assess, come up with some measures that would let you know if it's going well or not going well. Check in with the teachers. Let the teachers know that your child's taking a little medication hiatus, a little experiment. What do they notice? And then come back together with the information that you've collected and discuss. Um, Donata, I'm going to try really hard. Um, my son is in seventh grade, was just diagnosed with ADHD. He failed every class the first six weeks during virtual learning. When students were instructed to complete assignments, he was watching videos. We didn't have any idea who was 23 assignments behind. Since then, I've been sitting with him each day and working, and he's getting A's and B's, and Facebook took the rest of it. So I think you asked a question. I don't know what it is. What I want to say is... A lot of kids with ADHD cannot monitor themselves with school right now. They need an adult present. And if you're working from home, what I want you to think about is, is there a family member who could be on screen with your child who's on who's online? You know, can we do a Zoom situation? Does your father who lives, you know, an hour or two away, who's um, retired, could he sit? Could your mother, could your aunt? Who could be with your child during this time if you can't do it um, for the whole school day? Dana, yes, mood disorder and depression do go along with ADD. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, Akshan, Akansha. With an anxiety and ADHD diagnosis, there seems to be different schools of thought regarding treatment, medicating, anxiety first, or the ADHD. Can I speak to this? Yes, this is a really good point. So some people feel like for severe anxiety, uh, you want to deal with treat the anxiety first and the ADHD second. Other people think we want to treat the ADHD first because it's very possible that the ADHD is causing some of the anxiety. It usually depends on the severity of the anxiety um, and your prescriber's understanding of and assessment of your child. So I think, or of you, <laughs> you know, um, I think that for adults, they, um, you know, m more often than not, they might try um, the ADHD medication to see if that helps with anxiety, but it really depends on your personal history and your response. I can't see how testing would be accurate with remote learning, Nancy says. So amazingly, people are getting evaluated remotely. I don't, you know, it's it's kind of incredible. And they're getting um, useful information. And, and at least we'd have some assessment of what's going on. We want to try to get an assessment of where the executive functioning skills are breaking down so we can shore some of those up. And that may be testing, or you might just need to do some rating scales, which are very effective in, at, at assessing some of these challenges. Kirsty, I have combined ADHD and GAD. Social anxiety around ADHD behaviors is high. Have general anxiety too, but the social aspect can be debilitating. Yes, especially the post-event anxiety when I realize I've talked too much or overanalyzed the next day and then I'm avoidant of people. I verbal monologued on. So Kirsty, thank you so much for sharing this. I, I, I think oversharing is something that a lot of people with ADHD struggle with. And social anxiety right now is actually higher than 
it's ever been, mostly because we're not practicing our social anxiety skills in person. And so um, when we do see people or we do get together with them, there is a tendency to like, oh my God, I'm so glad to see you, or I overshare. And so one of the things that we have to learn is to kind of take cues from people when they're starting to sort of when they're showing you with their eyes or their face that they they need the topic to change it's hard to learn and i think it does take practice um uh, sue says my child is 12 and she doesn't want to take medication it makes her sick and she doesn't eat what can i do we've tried a few meds you know, I think in cases where kids have not been able to take medication, particularly stimulants, um, sometimes we, we prescribers will go to the non-stimulants and have more success. Um, what I would really focus on is finding someone, finding someone to help you work as a family on building the skills that she needs to live independently and more successfully. Um, Melissa says, my son with ADHD as a teenager doesn't grab grasp the concept of fairness, how can I explain it? Um, Melissa, I think I need a little more information about that um, because I think um, what, you're, what, what you're intimating to me is that he doesn't have empathy. He doesn't understand that there's, turn, that, you know, there's uh, other people have different needs and everybody has, um, wants to have the option of having their needs met. Um, Leo, ADHD can definitely be diagnosed as anxiety. Mine was. Absolutely. I see this all the time. Leo, I have ADHD and anxiety, but treating the ADHD greatly reduced the anxiety. Leo, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that is, you know, generally my, 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 um, my, my uh, predilection, you know, um, because I think that um, they, they run so much hand in hand and there's so much anxiety that's generated from having ADHD, missing cues, doing something differently, being afraid you're gonna make a mistake, et cetera. Uh, Jamie also, I found treating the ADD improves anxiety. Um, Chris, slow processing speed and poor working memory is hell, yes. It's hell. And the best way to deal with that is to come up with strategies to help you remember. Um, medication can help, you know, those neurotransmitters make those connections a little bit more quickly. Um, but there's nothing like good old fashioned systems to help you remember um, whatever they are, whether it's talking into your phone, whether it's using post its, whether it's um, having a calendar that's online and tangible. You know, whatever you need to do, uh, that can be helpful. Um, thanks, Mary. Sports are important. Julianne, avoiding people. I feel like I've talked too much the previous day is something I struggle with too. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to understand how much to share. And this is maybe something we'll, we'll do a whole nother um, uh, live on, which is oversharing. <laughs> you know, when when do you know what you've said and how much to say? Um, because I think this is a challenge for a lot of people with ADHD, particularly adults, and it it, it impacts not just their work but also um, uh, also their personal relationships. Okay, I'm going to stop in a minute. Um, let's see. Uh, how do I feel about genetic testing for the medication effectiveness? You know, GeneSight, which is the um, saliva swab, um, some people find it really helpful. Um, the research is, is mixed, but sometimes it helps prescribers decide what not to prescribe. And if you want to try it, you know, I certainly wouldn't recommend, I certainly wouldn't say no to that. Okay, and this is the last question I'm going to be able to take. 12-year-old um, boy, auditory processing and struggling incredibly with remote hybrid, how far to push him? You know, I think um, what we want to do is we want to decide what the bare minimum is and how much beyond the bare minimum your child is able to go. Right now, pushing your child to the point where you're ruining your relationship with them is not worth it pushing your child so they can meet the bare minimum, which is hopefully you've agreed upon, then the question is, what does that pushing look like? What can you agree on? What do the breaks look like? How long is the study time? Really talk with them about what they're capable of, engage a teacher in this conversation or a guidance counselor, and come up with a collaborative plan. That will make the difference in terms of their buy-in. 
Um, let's see, uh, horseback riding. Thank you, Annie. Bobby, get another doctor. I'm with you on that. Swimming is great exercise. It calms the nervous system. I agree. And there are different kinds of sports. You know, there's team sports like soccer and basketball. And there's also what I call individualized team sports. And sometimes these can be better for kids with ADHD, whether it's swimming or martial arts or tennis or track. They're in a team, but they're also doing something individually. And that can help them. Um, it can help them both get the exercise and be part of something, but it can also reduce the stress of feeling like you're missing things or you're not able to show up on the field for your for your teammates. Um, uh, Dana says, diagnosed with anxiety and depression first, meds weren't working, tested for ADHD, started ADHD meds, has helped you come off your anxiety meds. That's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. Yes, horses are brilliant. I agree. Horses are brilliant. Um, Kirsty, the regulating motivation. There's a problem. This is a problem. It makes the outside world think our inconsistency in persistence is selective. This is such a hard concept to explain. Um, and every time I do, it sounds like I'm making a mistake um, and for not doing things I don't like. And to a neurotypical person, this seems to somehow val invalidate my ADHD and make my struggles sound like a, like a label to excuse flippancy. So I think the most important thing that we want to do when we're trying to explain regulating motivation is to just talk about the science, the science of how motivation works in our brain. And what kind, what kinds of executive, which executive functioning skills are related to motivation? And if you want, we can do um, a live or a webinar on that. Again, I've spoken about that before, so that we can say this is not a failure of will. This is because I, I struggle with initiation in tasks that are are, un, are are uninteresting or challenging for me because we don't want to necessarily say that the tasks are uninteresting. Tas tasks that are challenging for me are harder for me because my brain just makes less dopamine. And dopamine is the chemical in our brain that helps us with reward and satisfaction and motivation. Really lay it out that way. That way, you don't have to make excuses for who you are you can explain that this is how it works. So I'm gonna stop for today. This was a very uh, dynamic uh, group. Thank you so much for attending. I think we have more to talk about on this topic and I guess that we'll come back in a couple weeks and circle back to it um, because there's so much to say. Thank you for your participation. Um, please feel free to reach out to Attitude with more questions and check out all of their resources on their website. Um, please um, uh, check out my resources on my website as well, www.